Well, thank you for having me today. It's a great honor to be here and uh, to be on stage speaking with you. And I'd like to start with a little story. Um, I was very fortunate a number of years ago to um, sell a little piece of business with a small company in Atlanta called Coca-Cola. And with the privilege of doing that, um, I got the great uh, responsibility of traveling to Atlanta every week for the better part of a year. So back and forth, leaving on Monday, coming back on Friday. And um, at the beginning, it was kind of fun. But over the course of the year, you have obligations, you start to miss your family. And um, like any business traveler, especially on a Friday, about this time, you start looking at your um, itinerary. When's my flight leaving? What's the traffic look like today? Is the flight that's coming in from Charlotte going to be there in Atlanta on time? So I'm going to get home on time? Especially if you have family obligations. And because you might want to get home for a football game. You might want to see your kids playing a game. And that's just these natural things we've got going on in our lives. And so it's a stressful part of the day that has, is completely unrelated to the rest of what you're doing. And the most stressful part of that process is usually the cab ride. It's the cab ride from where you are to the airport. Because you're worried about traffic. What if there's an accident? What if something goes wrong? Um, there are all kinds of things that, uh, what if the cab doesn't show up? Just that moment when you say, oh yeah, the cab will be there shortly, or Uber will be there shortly, and you're waiting two minutes. It's longer. It's longer. So there's stress that builds up. Now imagine the driver arrives, and they don't say a word. They're driving the car. They're driving slowly at a reasonable pace. They're not passing anyone. It looks like there's traffic. They're not changing lanes. They're not getting off the highway and your cortisol starts to build, your stress level builds, your blood pressure is building, and you eventually get to the airport, you make your flight, you catch the football game. Everything's good, but your blood pressure and your stress levels don't really decline until the plane takes off. Now, the next week you're in town, you want to get home, maybe for a dance recital, something like that. But this time, you're smarter. You tell the driver, I'm in a hurry. I need to get home for my daughter's dance recital. Can you please step on it? So what do they do? They pretend they're a fighter pilot, and they try and get you through traffic with far less skill and dexterity. And it's a white knuckle ride. And at some point during that ride, when your blood pressure is already elevated, your cortisol is high, you start thinking, maybe it's not worth making the dance recital. But you get there, mission accomplished. And then the next week, Similar situation, but you get the Goldilocks driver. The Goldilocks driver is just right, okay? They say, I understand. You hit some traffic. They say, we're gonna get off the highway right now, avoid some of this traffic. I heard there's an accident up ahead. Um, tell me about your son. What position does he play? You have a nice conversation. You get to your destination, and you're relaxed the whole time, even through the TSA line. So, the reality, the lesson from the story is that you can achieve your mission, but you can achieve your mission in different ways. It's the style with which you achieve your mission that determines the experience that the people you're leading have. And that's why we're going to talk about the arithmetic of leadership today. And the arithmetic of leadership, this is, there's no math here. We're just going to talk about four different leadership styles and I'm going to assign them to these basic arithmetic operators. So we're going to talk about division, addition, subtraction, multiplication. And that affects your mindset as a leader and the experience of the people you're leading. So let's jump right into this and talk about division. Now, usually when we're talking about math, we start with addition because it's the easiest thing and division is the hardest thing. But we're going to start with division because it's actually one of the most common leadership styles. And it's also the simplest and most popular one. Okay? Now, for leadership by division, through the style of division to work, what's necessary is someone must lose. I win, you lose. Okay? Divide and conquer. It's an old military tactic. That's leadership by division. And it's a binary situation. And what ends up happening is it's this us and them mentality. Okay? Us, them, win, lose, weak, strong. Okay? All these words, I'm right, you're wrong, okay? Little things that we hear a lot about in our society today. Smart, dumb, real, fake, okay? 
This is leadership by division. It's a style that is very caustic. Um, and if you walk away from one thing from this presentation, okay, they and them are two of the most dangerous words you can use as a leader. Because as soon as you use the words they and them, you are employing a leadership by division style. You're saying it's us and them. It's a very binary condition. It's not very welcoming. It's not very inclusive. And that's important to consider. And it, it's so consistent with everything all the speakers have said. Ori, Lilia, everyone is saying the same message. And for leadership by division to work, it requires a victim mindset. Okay? And most of the people here, okay, high achievers, high achievers even within your branch of the service, um, you have this internal locus of control where the world doesn't happen to me, I exert my authority on the world. Okay? And because of that, this doesn't apply to us. But the reality is, is most of the world is conditioned to have a victim mindset where the world happens to them because we have these interdependencies as a civilization. When was the last time you grew your own food? Okay, we have a supply chain that supplies it for us. In fact, most people don't even cook their own food. <laughs> you know, we have restaurants do that for us now. We have takeout taxi, okay? When was the last time you dug an outhouse and handled your own plumbing? We have dependencies for electricity, everything that's important to us, okay? So in this world, we are being conditioned as society to have a little bit of that victim mindset, whether we realize it or not. Now, leadership by division is the absolute laziest style. And because it's lazy, it's popular, okay? And it's been very popular in our society, and it continues to grow that way. Leadership by addition, okay, is more difficult. It's exceptionally challenging, and it's very risky. It's a very risky leadership style. It's the easiest mathematical operator for us to learn when we're in school, when we're in first, second grade, but it becomes very difficult to do as a leadership style. And part of that is because change is required. Change is necessary for leadership by addition to work. And change does not happen as a group. You don't make, wave a magic wand and say, everyone here has changed. That's not the way it works. It happens one person at a time. And the first people, the early adopters, they cross that bridge, and it's difficult, and it's dangerous, and it's risky because there's unknown. And after people get a few people get across that bridge, they say, oh, it's less risky than we thought. More people follow, but it always happens one at a time. And leaders that try to grow their tribe and welcome people in focus a lot on changing those people and bringing them in to the fold, okay? But leadership by, by addition is difficult because if you pay too much attention on the people you're trying to welcome and not pay enough attention to the people who are already there, Resentment can build up, and rejection of the new people to the tribe happens, and that's exceptionally important. So that's why this balancing act is so difficult for leadership by addition. It's a very powerful, powerful leadership style, but it's difficult because you have to manage and be inclusive of the needs of the people you're welcoming as well as the people who are already there. Now, it's fitting that we're in Montgomery, Alabama, and we did the civil rights tour the other day, which was fantastic, because one of the best leaders of all time that used this mindset was Martin Luther King. Very inclusive, very inclusive. It says, how can we all work together, okay? It wasn't us and them, it was us. Very inclusive. For leadership by addition to work, it requires a faithful mindset. It requires people to have faith. And how do people have faith if they have hope in a brighter, better future? The key is to make sure that that hope for a better, brighter future, that you articulate that not for the new people you're welcoming in, but for the people who are already there. And that's where this becomes so difficult and why it's so challenging. That's why it's a, it's a balancing act. It's a tightrope act because that balance is what's so difficult to do. But when people do it well, they are powerful leaders whose reach and impact transcend, transcend even their own lifespans. Okay? The people who do this the best, their leadership lives on even after they die. And that's an important thing to consider as you develop your own leadership style. So with that said, we're going to cover the next one, subtraction. 
Subtraction has a zero-sum gain. The leadership impact you have when you use the style of subtraction never increases beyond what you start with. It always decreases from there, okay? Because what you're in the business of doing is taking other people and putting them aside, pushing them down, making myself look better by pushing other people down. And that's leadership by subtraction. It's the earliest leadership style we learn, okay? Because it's one of these things where you're in the club or you're not. Are you with me or are you out? It's what we see on TV all the time. You are out of the tribe. <laughs> you know, Heidi Klum says, you are out. Donald Trump, you say, you are fired. You're in or you're out, okay? A lot of times this is leadership by subtraction. So you hear terms like this, which are super caustic, okay? You are less than equal. You are less than me. We even hear people say, especially when we're judging people from other cultures, less than human, okay? This is leadership by subtraction. It's a very caustic and dangerous style, but it's very pervasive because it's one of the first ones we learn because it's really a bully mindset. It's what we learn in grade school. It's what we learn on the playground. It's the bully mindset. And so bullies elevate themselves by diminishing others. And if you think you've never done this, um, everyone here has done this because we've all had that moment when we snapped at someone. Even in the most important leadership we have, job we have often is parents. Who here is a parent that never snapped at their kid? Okay, yeah, good, because I'd show you a liar. Um, this is the kind of impulsive leadership style that we have from back when we were cavemen and women. And it's something that just is natural. So it's something you have to be conscious of, aware of, so that you can resist the urge and the temptation to use it. So it's not whether people are good or bad, it's whether they're weak or strong, or you have the strength to resist the temptations to use those leadership styles. So in that regard, one of the more powerful leadership styles is leadership by multiplication. That's what's going on here today. Leadership by multiplication, that's what's actually going on here. It's one of the most laborious things to do. It's very difficult, but it's super, super powerful. It's powerful because essentially what you're doing is you're creating other leaders. Leaders creating other leaders. That's what the military does better than anyone else. This is fantastic. There is no other organization in the world other than the United States military that I think invests more in people and leadership than I'm aware of. It's phenomenal, okay? Leadership by multiplication, that's why we're all here. And it's got this, the biggest math content we've got is this is like geometric growth. When you do that, if you take a look at this picture, it's geometric growth. That's what we've got. And if you take a look at leadership by multiplication, it's got this facet to it that is really interesting, which is oftentimes as a leader, you're taking a step back. Look at the people with the blueprints there. They're taking a step back and they're letting other people do the work. They've invested time in teaching them what to do. And these people will eventually be the next generation of leaders, okay? But it takes time. Sometimes it's the decision you have to make, I could do it faster if I did it myself. Sure, but what if I taught someone else to do it? Would the next time I be able to scale and do other things better while that person goes and teaches someone else? So those are the decisions we have to make on a daily basis when we say, geez, it's not worth the time to teach someone else how to do this. Military does this great. Very proud of our military. So with that said, um, one of the other downsides of leadership by multiplication, it's often not rewarded, okay? It's not respected. Teaching is one of the most honorable professions there is. It's one of the most important professions there is, and yet, it's frequently undervalued, not just economically, but I think we underfund things. We don't necessarily give the right attention to it. Everyone knows it's important, but we never seem to quite nail that problem, okay? It requires a ton of time, a ton of effort, a ton of labor, and it's often not respected well. But it is by far the most powerful style of leadership you can employ. 
Now, with that said, let's take a look at these four different styles, okay? With these four different styles, we've got dividing and uniting, okay? Diminishing and building, okay? And you might say, well, I never diminish, I never divide, um, I'm above the fray. Um, everyone employs most of these tactics all the time. And what I think is very interesting to point out in this whole kind of thinking is that if you have a political preference, and you say, well, we are the uniters, okay? They're the dividers, okay? It's they and them. Everyone's doing the same stuff. Everyone is the same, okay? We are very frequently using these very lazy, easy methods of management and uh, methods of leadership. And so what I think is interesting question to ask yourself is what comes first? It's a chicken or the egg question. What comes first? Does your mindset impact your style or does your style impact your mindset? How does that work? And I think it's a complicated question. It's a complicated question because if you look at the four mindsets we spoke about, two of them are follower mindsets, two of them are leader mindsets. Okay? So we've got people who are followers who are either victims or they're faithful, okay? two different mindsets, and you can be both. Okay? And then we've got leaders who are bullies and builders, okay? and you can be both. Okay? So what comes first? Because if I had a complete locus of control, I could control everything in my power, I could do it all on my own, I could influence my style with my mindset. But when I have to depend on the mindsets of the followers, I have to work with what I've got. So understanding which leadership style to be in, what gear to be in as you navigate the road of leadership, that's very, very important to consider the mindsets of the followers, the mindset you want to bring to the table, and the leadership style you want to employ to achieve that objective. So who here is familiar with the growth mindset? Okay, there should be more hands going up. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the growth mindset right now. Growth mindset, I've got two people. One person says, I can do 200 push-ups. Badass. This person over here, I can do at least 40 push-ups, okay? Who's the bigger badass? Who's got the more potential? This person. Because when this person gets to 200, they're gonna collapse on the ground and say, like, oh my God, I did it, that was great. When this person gets to 40 and they do 41, they're gonna go, I wonder if I can do 50. When they do 50, they're like, I wonder if I can do 60. When they get to 200, they're gonna go, I wonder if I can do 250, okay? There's no upper bound on how they mentally look at their potential. And that is a growth mindset. And when we talk about leadership styles, the two leadership styles that speak to the growth mindset are addition and multiplication. The two leadership styles that speak to the fixed mindset are division and subtraction. We, the more successful people, tend to have a growth mindset. Many of you probably have a growth mindset. And this is what we're now teaching our kids in school. So in order to achieve that growth mindset and to foster that with your people you lead, Take advantage of the two leadership styles that live in that growth mindset world. And so with that said, I'd say, think back to the taxi driver. Think back to the journey. It's not entirely about the objective. It's how you achieve that objective. It's how you get from point A to B. Choose wisely your leadership style. Pay attention to these four leadership styles. And if you see one of your peers using a leadership style, that might not be appropriate for the moment, be a team player and help them recognize that maybe they shouldn't use the word they or use the word them. And if you do that, we're all better leaders. And so with that, I thank you very much.